Hi, everyone. Welcome to On the Park Bench. This is brought to you by Congress for the New Urbanism. And I am Mallory Batches. I'm the Director of Strategic Development for CNU, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. Um, we are, I am really excited to hear today's speakers. Um, they are going to be discussing adapting to the crisis, to the crises uh, that we're facing uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, this has been a series, this webinar has been uh, uh, an evolving series of topics related to you know, exactly what new urbanists are facing in this new world that, uh, that we all are enduring. <laughs> Um, and I think uh, this is a particular uh, this is a particular topic of how it goes beyond the immediate you know reactionary uh, sort of situation that many of us were in a few weeks ago and goes into how we're now starting to adapt to this new normal and adapt our practices, adapt how we look at cities as a result of these crises, the economic, the social, and obviously the health. And so uh, the speakers today are going to talk a little bit, a little bit about that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And um, speaking of adapting, uh, so uh, I'd like to bring up. For everyone who's um, tuning in, if you haven't already, take the opportunity to register for CNU 28. CNU 28, a virtual gathering, is how CNU has adapted to these crises uh, with our annual Congress. And it is really shaping up to be an incredible experience. We're, you know, we're trying to uh, provide a, a Congress for you that is, you know, something responsive to the issues that we're facing and responsive to the work that new urbanists do every day out there in our cities and there are more than 50 sessions we have more than a thousand registrants right now and we see those numbers growing we're continuing to add to the offering that will be available as part of the congress so uh, cnu.org backslash cnu28 is where you can register and find out more information but back to adapting to the crises in, in practice in cities um, across the country. Um, the speakers that we have today are really an incredible, um, you know, an incredible collection of practitioners and, and professionals. We are, um, we're starting with Marina Corey. She's a partner at uh, DPZ Partners and is the director of the Washington office. It's been there since 2007. So she saw a previous crisis um, there in Washington. And, um, and she is uh, just an, an incredible expert um, in urban redevelopment, regional planning, TODs, affordable housing, form-based codes in particular, and a longtime friend of mine. Um, Marina is also the chair of the executive board of the uh, form-based code institute, FBCI. Um, next, we will have Eric Webster, who is a native of Sandusky, Ohio where he is the city manager there and has been since 2014. Um, Eric, is, uh, Eric has been implementing the Bicentennial Vision Plan in Sandusky. And Sandusky is, if you don't know about the city, is really experiencing an extraordinary renaissance. And um, Eric is gonna be able to talk a little bit about how uh, they're having to perhaps, you know, uh, adapt and adjust based on what this pandemic has, has brought the city. Next, we'll have Megan O'Hara. Um, Megan has 15 years of experience in revitalization. She is principal in charge at Urban Design Associates UDA and is, um, she works on the transformation and equity building in neighborhoods that have experienced disinvestment. So obviously a part of this crisis and the outcomes of this crisis will likely be to only exacerbate those challenges. And so Megan's gonna talk a little bit about her work and, and how she's adapting. And then um, finally, we'll have Matthew Petty. Um, Matthew, is, he practices mixed use development in Northwest Arkansas and is, uh, and is also um, on the faculty of the Incremental Development Alliance, IDA. But 
he also, in his spare time, is in his third term on city council in the city of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so Matthew is going to talk, he can speak both to the private side of needing to adapt to these challenges as well as the municipal side. Um, so with that, uh, I am going to turn this over to Marina Corey. Marina, you're up. Thank you, Mallory. And I am going to share my screen. Um, all right, in a sec, share screen and play. Hi, everybody, can you see my screen? All right, I'm going to move forward, assuming that you can, unless I hear otherwise. I'm delighted to be here with all of you. I've uh, really enjoyed this new format of Park on the Bench series, and I hope today's will be equally informative to you all. I'm gonna get a little personal here and speak of how DPZ in particular adapted to the last recession and how we're carrying forward now. Uh, the, those lessons learned with this pandemic. Um, the image here is, uh, is one of Andres' initiative of the post-pandemic urbanism. We're really beginning to think through new building types, of course. Um, that's one of our many ongoing efforts. But I've divided my lessons into three parts, essentially. What I'm calling the mundane, the real, and the edge, or the ideal. Um, I'm going to be brief on the first because I think it's what a lot of us are doing already, but it's something that needs to be, that cannot be overlooked because if we if we don't do that, then we can't focus on the other more important efforts. So what is the mundane? Of course, we're all becoming more efficient. If we don't do this, um, nothing moves forward on the tail end of it. So we've, uh, we're, we're data-driven in ways we've never been before. We've become more adept at looking ahead, projecting scenarios, looking at project billability and employee billability. You know, we've, in both cases, back in 2008, and now uh, reduced whatever expenses we could immediately. Um, and, and tried not to be too optimistic in our outlooks. And we, of course, we assess that effectiveness by uh, going back and forth and measuring and seeing were we accurate in the way we assessed before. And um, I have to say we were proud that we never laid anybody off in 2008. And I, I can only hope that that happens again this time. Being cautious to accept the new circumstances and adjusting our expectations quickly is really about trying to be smart. For the first time in 2008, um, we, um, our managing partner uh, helped us draft a business plan. It was the first time we'd ever done so uh, to try and manage our firm more effectively. And too many planners and, and architectural firms in particular don't, are not as conscious as they need to be from the business standpoint of it. And I think it has really helped us um, try to figure out ways in which we can, um, we can manage the firm in, in, a more, in a more direct manner. It, we, it has also enabled us to um, look to seek advice and form relationships in ways we had never done before and shake things up a little. So we uh, change accountants. <laughs> we even change our financial advisors, which, is, which have helped us in this process. Uh, being resourceful, so adapting to new project types. I think we realized early on, back in 2008, that projects like our new towns, our big new towns, like in Kentlands, where I am, uh, we, those kinds of projects were going to disappear for a while and we'd need to focus on infill work, which we began to do, things like pocket neighborhoods and lean codes and, uh, and now tiny houses. And um, we, we began to look at our projects and, 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 and see how many of our projects were of the small type, the medium type, and the large type, what percentage it made up of our income, and to try adjust our time accordingly. Uh, being positive to keep staff engaged and maintaining morale is always important. It's hard to do in uncertain times, but the image you see here is of uh, one of our younger uh, designers who's, um, who's really forced us to do our love. We used to have lunch and learn. It's now called sip and learn or happy hour learning. We, we, we're, we're often too busy to, um, to learn from what the other offices are doing. But since this pandemic has started, we've been very, um, because we need to be in touch with, these, with ourselves, we've been much more rigorous about sharing and, 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 and highlighting projects that we've all done on, on a systematic basis. Every Friday afternoon, we get together for happy hour. And that's been fun. And last but not least is being an advocate in your own community first, uh, figuring out ways to contribute to something other than this all-consuming work that's important for all of us, that provides us with our sense of purpose in life, but finding ways in your community to help directly uh, as much as you can, I think um, it can be very rewarding. So what does that mean for the real? For the real, it means immediate adjustments that were made right away. So we all took the lead exam to become green certified. Andres was reminding me of this yesterday. It was funny, the office became instantly green. Um, but we also continued to evolve our charrettes and we, be, we had shorter charrettes and it coincided with when the time many of us became parents. So we became, um, we, we became experts at the Monday to Friday charrette before our, our charrettes were much longer. 
um, we cut salaries in the sense that our founding partners actually took, they went off salary for a while, uh, back in 2008 when we, were, um, when we were really struggling. And it's something that few firms can probably afford to do, but those that can should. And it helped us get through a time crunch and we eventually paid them back in full, but it was helpful to have that, um, that at the time. We developed new initiatives. I think we're all doing that, understanding new circumstances. And it helped us also uh, give us the impetus to move forward with new uh, initiatives or lingering initiatives that we had. So of course, many of us um, have, have taken stabs at that, but what came out of our office along with the collaboration of many others in particular were lean urbanism, pink zones, and now you know this post pandemic that um, Andres is, is, and others are focused on. Uh, we discovered new markets and that's really f finding ways in which to turn opportunity into luck and capitalizing on new market potentials. So in, uh, we, we were working in 2007 on an ag urbanism project in Canada that helped us move forward with our, um, with our um, agricultural urbanism initiative. Projects we were doing in the UK, a capital, we capitalized on that and built one, two, three, four projects which enabled us to develop our scenario planning. In the Middle East, South, South America and Asia, we, we, we moved forward with our interactive regional planning and some new codes. Um, it's gonna be harder now since the entire world is suffering, but finding new markets in whichever way you can, whether it's uh, certain initiatives or whether it's certain places, I think that has helped us in the past and we hope it continues to help us. We formed alliances, very deliberate alliances in ways we hadn't done before, in particular with large, uh, large engineering firms to, to different degrees of success. When there was no overlap in our skill set, it was, it was better. When there was some overlap or intrusion into other people's territories, it became more problematic. Um, but it's also afforded us the opportunity to collaborate with other architectural and planning firms that are like-minded like we are. And that's been really nice, you know, m most recently with the UDA in Saudi Arabia. And it's been, it's been, um, it's been really, really fun to, to, to do that. And then we reframed and repositioned our existing strategies for whatever this new normal is and, and really focused in on what is our firm identity. And that was asking ourselves a question, are we sort of the department store or are we a boutique store? Do we provide every service for everyone at any time? Or do we really want to be focused on um, looking, focusing our practice on what our most useful services are and looking at the work we do exclusively through those lens of being adaptive and resilient communities? Um, and, and of course, really taking the time to think about uh, what do we want? We, too often we make, or many, too many firms, and we fell into this as well, responding to RFPs sort of as a knee-jerk reaction. Any RFP that came by our table, it was hard not to if we didn't have enough work. And DPZ had never done an RFP up until 2008. Uh, and then all of a sudden we had to learn how to do them and learn how to do them very quickly. And it was a learning curve, you know, uh, we were more successful in some areas and less successful in others. Um, but you know, this, this, the, the refocusing or reframing as adaptive and resilient communities is helping us look at, um, in ways we hadn't before, at secure settlements and now compounds. And, and that's exciting to us uh, as we start to develop these building types. And the last one, which is probably the most important for us, is how do we maintain our cutting edge? How do we continue to be innovative in ways that we have in the past? Staying ahead of the curve, thinking about what this means for the future, and, and projecting the impacts of current events onto that, and really trying to maintain a leadership position um, as much as we can. Publishing's been, uh, education publishing's been an important component of our work, and some of, the, of our partners have done have done really well with that. Obviously, in the, since the last recession, uh, Galina Spore Repair Manual came out, Andres and Paul Crabtree are still working on the public works manual, uh, but the Garden Cities, which was an initiative that came out of the ag herb work we did in Canada, that's come forward now. Sinan Antonio is um, ready to hopefully soon release his Green by Design book. So it's enabled us to really focus on, on that that was, that was sort of by the way, laying by the wayside. And part of that is helped by finding the R&D opportunities and projects. So really, um, Andres likes to say that we free him, we give him time to think. I take an hour a day uh, to not worry about the office at all and really just think. And that's enabled him to do some, a lot of R&D on behalf of, of the office, which of course has served us well, uh, and, and let the day-to-day -day operations and the charrettes and all of that be run by the rest of us. Um, but it's also important to remember that R&D that R is being civic-minded and uh, uh, keeping us alert to the great work that's being done by other CNUs. Where, uh, and many people have said this, we're great collaborators. And so uh, taking taking and learning and, and, and instructing people of, of the work that, that's been done by others is also very, very important. For us now, as you can see from this drawing, it's about affordable housing and adaptive communities in general. Um, 
and the nurturing existing clients first and, and going back to revisit our built work has also helped us a lot in the past recession to really help our communities and our clients figure out well, what's very relevant about what they did and what we know works. How is it even more relevant or useful now? Uh, what's going to become more necessary as we think to move forward and how we adapt to a new, uh, uh, a new condition. And uh, these different ways of trying to find our clients and, and help them uh, and maintain those connections, which is also very important. But we've been very, um, it's been fun to go back and see our projects built and what has been built in the past uh, few years and reminding ourselves of why we did what we do. And, and lastly, you know, curating our, our expertise is really being about being vocal and reaffirming who we are as an office. Sometimes it's hard to do when we're worried about the day-to-day -day business of keeping an office running, but it's, it's really about actively putting our face out there and, um, and, and really focusing on that work that's important to us. So since I am an optimist by nature, you know, I'm seeing this pandemic, this particular moment in time as, a, as an opportunity to rebalance and to take a moment to manage our stress wisely and um, effectively. Uh, you know, our, the fact that we have now this gain time at home with family cannot be underestimated. This picture is of our daughter, Lila, who now comes to work with me every day. And she does her classwork in here and I have her with me, you know, eight hours a day. And it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's, it's fun. I mean, she's still at the age where she likes spending time with us. In fact, she's here now. Uh, so that brings me joy. For other people, it's been uh, re resurrecting old dreams and projects and, and being able to move those forward. So um, while we don't know where this will lead us, I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's enabling us and as a practice, on a, but also on a personal level to think about uh, how, 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 we, how we're going to adapt to this crisis is essentially about um, thinking through the, the tools we have at our disposal. And as I was preparing this presentation, I realized we have a lot of them. And of course, through the CNU, we have even more of them um, to help our neighbors, our community, our, our most disenfranchised, find ways to move forward and, um, and, and in, in the most effective and uh, possible way. I think a lot about the fact that we're, you know, we hear a lot and throughout through the news that are, that we, that are, we are bombarded on on a daily basis is the fact that we're Many people think we're a divided country. I tend to think that we're less divided and more dis less divided, but more disconnected. And I think that's where many of the problems lie. And if and that's where the CNU can provide uh, tremendous tools. We have that toolkit. We have those strategies to connect our neighborhoods, and through those connections, uh, we get to know our neighbors. We get to understand them. We get to feel compassion for them, and we get to um, to help help those who are most in need and help help those communities sort of thrive. So on, on that note, I think I will turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Marina, and, and thank you, Mallory, and everyone for having me on today. It's really exciting to be able to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Sandusky. Uh, as mentioned in the intro, I'm a Sandusky native. I've been back here for about six years serving as city manager after having spent most of my career previous to that working in Cleveland, which is just 60 miles west. Uh, and, and, um, and community and economic development issues. But it was really a great opportunity, I'm gonna share my screen here, to come home uh, six years ago to talk a little bit about, uh, or to, to get into, hold on, let me make sure I do this right. There we go, I think it's coming up. Do we have it? Just waiting for the screen to pop up so I can dive in. Do you, Mallory, do they have the screen now? Do you know? It's good. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to dive in. Uh, I came back six years ago and, and just to give a little bit of background on uh, what it's not. Hold on one second, it, but I can't get the screen to switch. But I'm, I'm trying to fix my screen here. You know why that's okay. There we go. It's just had a real delay. So this is the context of Sandusky. Sandusky is a small city of 25,000 people that sits uh, on the shore of Lake Erie uh, in the western basin of Lake Erie. Again, I mentioned that we're 60 miles west of Cleveland. Uh, like any other sort of historic legacy city, uh, we faced a lot of challenges over the last several decades. We had a GM plant and a Ford plant that closed. Uh, we've had a lot of sprawl from the core city into outlying townships and surrounding areas uh, in the community. And, and one thing that we did have to rely on in Sandusky that I think coming out of the last recession, when we started to plan for our bicentennial, 
uh, was that we are a very large uh, region for hospitality and tourism, uh, most notably for Cedar Point, which is the uh, largest seasonal amusement park in the world. It's actually celebrating its 150th uh, anniversary from opening. And, and they play an outsized role in our community, attracting about 4 million tourists a year. But in addition to that, we're also the home of the Lake Erie Islands, which are large attractions and have several indoor water parks. And so collectively, the region that Sandusky is the largest city in uh, draws about 10 million people annually, and, and tourism is a $2 billion part of our economy. The challenge with that historically is that uh, it was a very seasonal tourism economy, and we had become very dependent on really well-paying manufacturing jobs some of which still exist, but not nearly to the extent as they did in, say, the 1980s and the 1990s. And so as we were approaching our bicentennial, which took place in 2018, uh, we made a strategic decision that we had to take steps to diversify from our hospitality-based economy. Uh, but to build on that asset, we partnered with Cedar Point, and we raised both admissions taxes on the park and did a, a modest income tax increase for the community and created with partners, City Architecture, which is a Cleveland-based firm, and the Strategy Design Partners, also a strategic planning firm in Cleveland, what we call a Bicentennial Vision Plan. And in the Bicentennial Vision Plan, our goal was to transition from a seasonal tourism economy to more of a year-round economy in which the tourism assets that existed uh, provided more uh, both year-round activity, but also helped us to improve quality of life for the many residents in the area, as well as to potentially create a quality of life that could attract new folks. Uh, and, and that's been working very well for us uh, previous to COVID-19. Uh, we've seen over $300 million of public and private investment in the city since the passage of Issue 8 and the adoption of the Bicentennial Vision Plan. Uh, a lot of that is a, a new initiative to build new elementary schools in our neighborhoods. Uh, we also partnered with Erie County and Cedar Point to take an abandoned airport on the east side of town to build the Cedar Point Sports Center which is a, a large indoor and outdoor sports complex that attracts visitors for those areas. And then our historic downtown, which sits right on Sandusky Bay and overlooks Cedar Point, uh, has seen about a hundred million of investment. Uh, and, and, and really we did a huge focus as related to the types of investment to focus on placemaking and connectivity. Uh, what you see on this slide here are uh, some surface parking lots. We had two city owned surface parking lots. The first in the upper left corner we transitioned from what was a 300 space parking lot directly on the lake that served as uh, for ferry customers going to the islands. And we'll reopen that in actually just a few weeks to uh, have uh, a boardwalk, a year round pavilion, uh, uh, an event lawn that can host events. And that's created a beautiful transformation of that space. Uh, and then in addition to that, we took Shoreline Drive, which is our waterfront street. And we have narrowed that street. We've added a 10 foot a bike path along the mile of that street, which is supposed to be part of the Sandusky Bay Pathway Network, which will eventually be an 11 mile trail within the city and hopefully an 80 mile trail uh, throughout the region. And then on the, the bottom right corner, that's the construction of the Cedar Point Bowling Green State University School of Resort and Attraction Management. That took a city owned surface parking lot uh, and is creating a, a bachelor's degree program of, uh, for Bowling Green State University, which is main campus is about an hour to the west of Sandusky we're going to directly partner with Cedar Fair, the parent company of Cedar Point. Uh, and there will be 80 apartments in that building as well as a 20,000 square foot classroom facility for those folks to live in a 10 class in the heart of our downtown. All of, and, and that being on a year round basis is a good example of uh, you know, what we're trying to do to, to take that tourism advantage that we have, but to, to make it a little more sophisticated and mature so it can make an impact year round. Uh, and, that, and with that, we do have uh, incredibly hard hit neighborhoods in Sandusky mostly by sprawl over the last 20 or 30 years. We adopted a Sandusky Neighborhood Initiative, which uh, in the upper left-hand corner, that was an abandoned uh, bank structure that had been there. And we turned that into a gateway into a, a nice neighborhood. We've adopted and funded a public art program and master plan. We've worked to calm traffic throughout our neighborhoods through crosswalks and stop signs and, and many other things. And we've begun to replace neighborhood parks, all of which are designed to make the city a little more walkable, a little more livable. Uh, and we've also invested a significant amount on an annual basis from that tax increase uh, in order to reinvest in our housing stock. And, and the other big thing uh, that I think has made a critical difference because, you know, as we've also focused on placemaking, connectivity has been really important. The city of Sandusky operates the county's transit system, and it was basically three routes that ran on an hourly basis. We've doubled both the number of routes that we've had. We've uh, doubled the frequency on many of those routes from transit occurring every one hour every 30 minutes and we've added seven day service because what we realize is we're a very service and hospitality based economy 
Our jobs just don't exist on a Monday through Friday basis, but we need to get people to work, uh, which is what the system primarily uh, offers on a, on a weekend basis too. And then finally, we entered into a partnership with Cedar Point where all of their 5,000 seasonal employees are given a bus pass. They used to provide transportation from the dorms for those folks uh, privately, which was at great cost to them. Now they have access to Sanusky Transit, which has been really helpful for us because in addition to just giving those folks a ride out to the, the sort of further corridors where the big boxes existed, all of our routes hub out of downtown for the first time. And so it's given those four or 5,000 employees a lot greater access to that downtown environment. Uh, and, and all of these uh, positive steps have put us in a position where just last year, we were named uh, in a contest by USA Today as America's best coastal small town, which is exciting to me because I think that was an online vote and it showed that in the last five years, the people of this area had really started to believe again in some positive progress here. Uh, in addition to that, the governor of Ohio in 2017 chose to deliver his state of the state address from our historic state theater in downtown, also to highlight the effect uh, that the city's work was having on small cities. And, and I say all that because uh, up until COVID-19, we were a lot like a lot of other small legacy cities and that for the first time in a long time, uh, we had shown signs of success. And we were doing that with many things that were right out of the CNU playbook as far as placemaking, connectivity, focusing on equity, celebrating our diversity, connecting our neighborhoods through public transportation and bike trails. And that we had the potential to have that all wiped out. Uh, and in fact, Sandusky, because we rely heavily on tourism-based taxes, uh, including 20% of our revenue on an annual basis, coming directly from admissions taxes paid predominantly by people who are attending Cedar Point, the amusement park, uh, we're probably on a per capita basis, the most impacted city in Ohio. And we've had to make some pretty devastating cuts, including cutting the pay of our managerial employees. Uh, we've already restructured 18 positions uh, out of the city. We had no other choice. We're spending down our reserve this year. Uh, these choices have been devastating, but, uh, and we'll probably continue to have to make more. We're hopeful that it will be safe for Cedar Point to open later this year, but we can't take that for granted. And the timing of COVID-19 was really hard on us because most of the businesses here have difficult winters uh, and then get ready to really make their money in the spring, summer, and the fall. Uh, where we got, just had gotten through that winter and folks were getting ready to staff up for spring. And then, you know, the lights were shut off. And so it's been really important for us to maintain a positive message. Uh, and we've done a campaign called Sandusky Stronger Together, in which we've done videos and community events that practice safe social distancing, but at the same time, give people opportunities to connect with their residents so that we don't lose our momentum. And, and a lot of the positive changes as they are in, in, in a lot of cities like Sandusky have not been without controversy here. You know, there's a lot of folks that didn't understand why we were investing in downtown. There were a lot of folks that didn't understand why we would take parking lots in a downtown that was growing and to convert those to other types of activities that might put a further strain on parking. You know, there's always that question of investments in neighborhoods versus downtowns. And, and while the vast majority of our budget is spent in those neighborhoods, uh, it's always more controversial to see investment happening that leads to more private investment. And so what we've tried to do, and I think what a lot of uh, cities are in a position of right now, is that those naysayers or those critics of, of these types of investments are having a moment in which they can really push hard to say, go back to just exclusively the basics, just you know, focus on safety services only, focus on paving streets only. And we have fought while we've made a lot of cuts to these programs, to make sure that we don't go backwards and that we continue to invest into the types of things that are in the Bicentennial Vision Plan, which was really just not about celebrating Sandusky's 200 year history, but was about creating a future that could be vibrant and help us to attract new residents back into the community. And so what we've really done as a, as a way to do that are two different things. Uh, one of which is we've really prioritized which investments we need to continue to make that are gonna be the most catalytic. And on a large scale that includes the Sandusky Bay pathway, which is that citywide and then eventually a regional bike trail uh, we've been working with an environmental design group based in Ohio to design that trail. It's an engineering now and through tax increment financing that we've placed on the new Cedar Point Sports Center and various projects in the downtown, we will be able to predominantly fund that and continue it. And we are going to continue to go forward with the new downtown master plan uh, that we recently selected MKSK, which is a Columbus based firm uh, to help us to build on the progress that we've made over the last several years and, and, and figure out how we key those growths and, and what's important there is how we take the vibrancy that has existed downtown and make sure that that can also be felt and connected to Sandusky's neighborhoods through our transit system, our walkability and our bikeability. And then finally, we're looking at what are the types of activities from a placemaking perspective, from a connectivity perspective 
that we can do in a really tactical, low cost way. You know, something as simple as a four way stop sign in some neighborhoods could be the difference between making that more livable for families. Uh, and so we're really reviewing everything that we can do from the perspective of livability, small projects, small public art projects, small neighborhood, you know, resident led projects so that we don't allow those small victories to be lost uh, or our momentum, our momentum to be uh, taken away on a permanent basis, even as we deal with what are really some profound impacts of the virus on our community. So with that, I'll turn this over to Megan. Thank you, Eric. Um, great. I'm going to be presenting Urban Design Associates' um, response and adaptations to COVID-19 as a um, private design and consulting firm. And I've divided these up into three categories for the discussion. First, how are we adopting, adapting to respond to the changing needs of our clients? And then secondly, how are we adapting to meet the heightened needs in the communities that we're working in? And third, how are we adapting to engage people in a way that actually works for them? So starting with our clients, we've been finding that clear communication protocols and creating uh, tangible plans of action are extremely important and helpful in this time. So even though the context is different, the process really hasn't changed. We're still listening, we're still testing ideas, and we're still deciding. Um, but obviously the risk environment that we're all living in is changing daily. So the tools that we implement need to be flexible to respond to the situation. And we know that different parts of the country, different cities, different neighborhoods are going to oscillate along this spectrum of risk from where we are today, mostly on the left-hand side where we're communicating from home virtually um, to something in the middle where we're communicating with physical distance and we have hybrid models um, and then eventually getting back to our low risk environment where we can communicate in person. So just a couple of anecdotes about responding to clients needs. I'm going to highlight a few of these. Um, I'm finding that clients are very appreciative of what I'm calling squeaky clean project management right now, uh, making sure that absolutely nothing falls through the cracks, breaking things down into tangible mini steps and very thoughtful plans of action. I think many people have seen the research around micro habits and mini habits and how effective that can be in getting things done. And the, true is, the same is true for um, next steps on projects. I think clients are overwhelmed by um, financial impacts and um, personnel and HR impacts and the needs of their communities. So the more that we can do um, to be good project managers, the, the better off our projects will be. And then finally, just acknowledging that when you have a, a new project that is starting in the COVID-19 context, it takes more to get those projects off the ground on the front end. So we find that we're putting in extra work to build momentum and to um, lay out the process, to establish the relationships and to get the, the process actually moving. So this is a great opportunity for private design firms and consulting firms, I think, to help your clients lay out a strategy and, and an approach on the front end of projects. Thinking about the communities that we work in, uh, both the immediate needs and the persisting needs are heightened right now. Uh, the majority of the neighborhoods that I work in are mixed income and low income neighborhoods. And I'm, I'm sure everyone knows just how uh, critical the immediate needs have become in, especially in these neighborhoods. Uh, to put some context to this, uh, we're working in East St. Louis and one of our clients did a COVID-19 needs assessment that looked at the month of April. So for those families and households, 45% of the families had a member suffering from a chronic health condition. 39% of the families are experiencing food insecurity. 32% of the families needed either a tablet, a computer, or internet access for their kids to be able to complete their schoolwork. 70% of the households needed antibacterial soap and cleaning uh, disinfectant cleaners, and 55% of the households actually lost employment due to COVID-19. So the process actually needs to um, jump in to start addressing these needs. 
and our partners are leveraging and working through the partnerships that were established through the planning process to try to meet those immediate needs in the community. And then in addition to the immediate needs, uh, the affordable housing crisis, which was already um, in a dire position before the health emergency is being exacerbated. Um, so the first point there I, I think is important. We're all very focused in CNU on um, proving that density is not contributing to transmission, um, which is an important conversation, but we can't ignore the fact that one consequence of people being asked to stay home for months is that indoor and outdoor space suddenly become in more in demand and that that has a price impact on the real estate and for housing especially. So that is making affordability of housing um, even more of an issue than it was before. And you can see some of the um, other statistics here. These are actually from NARO and affordable housing um, developers and, and authorities are facing uh, delays and barriers to the construction of affordable housing and also financing and funding implication, implication as dollars go elsewhere. Um, so some of the things that we're doing to adapt to this, the first, we have to be very real about uh, the, the challenge ahead and the political leadership and the funding that it's going to take to address these gaps that are widening. And we're starting to pivot mid process to make sure that our plan recommendations are addressing um, the immediate needs and then also this changing context for housing affordability and housing demand. And then we're tying each one of those recommendations to an actual funding source or a partnership resource that makes sure that uh, the recommendations for housing are actually implementable. And then fourth, remembering that we're also advocates for housing policy at every level of government that can begin to address compounding injustices uh, that we're seeing right now. So the final adaptation I wanted to talk about is the way that we engage. And we need to make sure that we're engaging in a way that actually works for the people that we're reaching and gives them a real voice and decisions. Uh, there's been a lot of really excellent work around uh, virtual charrettes and digital engagement. And I think those tools are, are very exciting We've developed a toolkit approach that we're starting to implement right now in several neighborhoods. Um, but doing this specifically in mixed and low income neighborhoods, we found that we need to adapt even further than thinking about a virtual model. Um, so in these neighborhoods, we need more of a hybrid model. It's not entirely digital and virtual and it's not entirely in person right now. Um, so here's, here's one example of what we've been doing in several cities. Um, and here's where the, the work on the front end comes in. We're working with housing authorities and neighborhood organizations uh, and our clients to help identify a group of neighborhood leaders and advocates that can help us run the process. And the very first step is asking those neighborhood leaders, what do you think is the best way to reach your neighbors and the people in your community? And not surprisingly, we get very different answers in different places. So starting with the local knowledge first, We've also been trying to find set-asides in the project budget to compensate these ambassadors for the work and the time that they're putting in. And then we're actually breaking down um, the resident population um, into basically phone trees, old fashioned phone trees under neighborhood uh, resident leaders, uh, about 30 households, which means that you need 3% or so of your total population as these ambassadors and leaders. Uh, so we put together a spreadsheet uh, under each of the neighborhood leaders of each household and identify which households are not comfortable or don't have a way to join a, a virtual meeting or access a website. And then these neighborhood leaders and our ambassadors are helping convene those residents that don't have a virtual way to engage in a physically distanced meeting of around eight people and play a video of the um, video presentation by the project team and then we join by video to have a discussion uh, with those residents to make sure that we're reaching um, all of those households. And then I just wanted to, to touch on the importance of low tech options. Uh, one of our staff members, Bethany Martin, uh, worked previously at the De Detroit Collaborative Design Center. They're doing some excellent, excellent things with uh, physical paper surveys. Uh, Co-Urbanize and JBG Smith have run uh, text message surveys that people can submit answers to just on simple touch tone phones. Um, and then just a couple of other ways that we're trying to address the digital divide. 
Victor Dober, Dober described the telephone town hall uh, in a previous on the park bench. And I just wanted to share with everyone that we've found that uh, Zoom has a similar function where you can auto dial folks into the audio uh, for virtual community meetings if they don't have a way to join by web. Uh, I think Matthew is next and I look forward to the conversation later. Thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate um, the toolkit and, and uh, Megan, what UDA is doing with uh, to, to target uh, communities that, that may be disenfranchised by a lot of our processes. I want to talk a little bit about that too. Uh, and what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is I want to give you a little bit of context about how uh, my city, Fayetteville, Arkansas, is uh, is reacting to what's going on now. Um, but I wanna contextualize that in some of the even bigger issues uh, that we're dealing with that I think uh, COVID-19 um, has exposed and uh, raised and, and elevated up the priority list of things that we need to deal with as, as city planners and as people who manage cities. Let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, so you understand what my experience is. Um, I'm a private sector uh, planner with my company uh, doing small area plans and, and coding um, for other jurisdictions, but I've been elected a council member three times in my 12th year as a council member for the city. Um, I chair the tourism agency here, which has been heavily impacted. And I also chair the transportation committee uh, here. And so we have been uh, reworking uh, all of our our transportation divisions work plans in response to um, anticipated changes to the revenue. And the revenue streams going forward. I also teach uh, uh, neighborhood uh, 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 level development, neighborhood scale development um, for the incremental development uh, uh, alliance nationwide. And I'm gonna bring some of those lessons into, into this. One of the things I've noticed is that a lot of people in my community um, and in communities like Fayetteville still think things are going to go back to normal. And I think that's a very dangerous way of thinking. We're doing a lot to mitigate against the impacts of the outbreak. Almost everywhere that we have been able to make administrative changes, we have adjusted permitting procedures and field inspections uh, to reduce the need for our staff to leave the office or to leave their, their home offices. We've changed uh, application procedures to reduce the amount of public hearings and so on and so forth. We've implemented a lot of the small, tiny changes that planning departments uh, have identified but don't often get the chance to actually spend time on. And we've had to do it out of necessity because we have simply not been able to transition to virtual project reviews and maintain the volume of project review that is expected of us. And still, uh, even though we've made all these changes, I think there's still an, an expectation that we are going to be able to go back to normal um, with the rest of the economy soon. And I don't see that happening uh, uh, anytime soon. Of course, we all read um, the dread-inducing reports from uh, the scientists these days. But more than that, what I'm also concerned about is the psychological wake of, uh, uh, that, that will happen even after the danger, the physical danger of uh, the outbreak has been addressed. People are going to be afraid to gather again in large groups, uh, and a lot of people will be afraid to gather again at all with their friends for quite some time. That will last a while, and even as things reopen, even as our large venues reopen and so on and so forth, the notion that they're going to reopen again at full capacity and produce the same kinds of tax revenues that they did before, I don't think is realistic. Especially whenever we think about what might be coming next. One of the things that I think the CNU uh, is well poised to talk about is the need for adaptation and adaptation technologies, which are different than simply mitigating against the impacts of a crisis like COVID-19 or climate change. 
it's one thing to talk about how we might do better meetings like this or share, uh, how we might network, continue to network or to share ideas. I think that's important, um, but our cities themselves still have to adapt in in, in, in ways that are, that are in a lot of cases fundamental and hard. And the arguments about for and against those adaptations are more or less the same as they've always been, but we might have an opportunity with COVID to do things a little, um, a, a little more assertively. It's absolutely necessary. Restaurants and hotels in my city alone suffered in March a 30% drop in revenue, and we only closed on the 13th. April was entirely closed, and so even though we expect takeout and, and so on and so forth is occurring, even though our governor of Arkansas has opened back up travel from uh, most other states, we expect that impact to linger to grow and then to linger um, for quite some time. That means that the trans that, that means things like the transition to virtual learning environments means that the overall demand for office space is not coming back. There will be a latent amount, but it will be fundamentally different. This has me extremely worried um, as uh, someone who believes that our cities are meant to make our citizens' lives better because the outcomes of the inequality that we have in our system, I think is going to become even more deeply rooted as a result of this crisis. People who can't afford to move to a clean neighborhood, probably in the suburbs with the jobs and the minimum walkability uh, that uh, some of those great uh, suburban uh, developments have today are going to be uh, unusually uh, 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 wealthy compared to the rest of the country that is unable to re relocate even if they wanted to. So a lot of what the CNU has led on and talked about, I think is, is still um, absolutely important and perhaps even more so in light of COVID and certainly in light of the growing crisis of climate change. I don't want to just be doom and gloom though. Uh, of course, uh, I do want to present a real solution. I want to talk a little bit about uh, a resiliency program, a tool uh, that we've developed and have now implemented. Uh, we were just recognized for this, we call it a pattern zone. We were recognized with a uh, charter award last week. And the council adopted this uh, last week as well. And uh, what this is, is it's a combination zoning and economic incentive to make building new homes primarily, although we can do commercial buildings, to make building new households for people to live in cheaper and to make it certain that good quality architecture and urbanism is the most convenient program uh, to execute. This saves money and goes directly to our goals of making neighborhoods more resilient against outbreaks like COVID and against concerns like homelessness. For instance, in Fayetteville, our homelessness uh, rate has uh, increased 150% in the last decade, uh, in spite of uh, what feels like a construction boom. We simply aren't able to keep up. We recommend a program like this because it has real savings. These are real numbers from a Texas market. We wouldn't expect that anybody would actually save this much money, but we would expect that they would save half of it or more. And we haven't assigned a value to the amount of time that's saved in design or permitting. What a pattern zone is, the way we achieve this is we pre-approve architectural plans at the city so that the review can be expedited and we license those ex architectural plans so that they can be given away for free to applicants in the community. It's rather simple. We combine it with a regulating plan and we pre-approve those buildings on a street by street or even a parcel by parcel basis. We do that so that we can frankly subvert the expectations of the zoning code. Most zoning codes in communities are layer cakes uh, built up one complaint at a time over the decades. 
And it becomes very difficult to do what should be straightforward rezonings because we often hear that the principles are fine, but who knows what the project will look like. And so we subvert those expectations by actually pre-approving the buildings themselves so we can say exactly what they will look like. We take great care to make sure that variety is baked into the program, but that also the, that the buildings are familiar. You see here a family tree of building types, from building types all the way to building permits. This is an excerpt from the adopted plan. The first row, those are the building types. We have a cottage, we have a convertible flex house. A, a, it can be converted from single family house to a duplex, an apartment house and a walk up. And then we vary the materialities and the floor plans, the frontages, the roof lines, and all of these are detailed in plans that are licensed to the city. And anyone can use these if they are an applicant in the city, so long as they build them almost exactly as specified. Limited variations are allowed, very limited. And if they comply voluntarily with supplemental site construction criteria. What this allows cities to do is to create a reference standard instead of a minimum standard. We beg applicants to exceed the minimum standards with almost every application that comes into the door. A reference standard, on the other hand, is something that is more convenient for applicants to use and is an elevated standard that they can, that other people can aspire to exceed. That supplemental site criteria, because it's voluntary, can be almost anything the city wants. If you have a legal issue with forcing everyone to protect a riparian buffer or forcing everyone to plant street trees in a certain way or forcing the building to be in a uh, build to zone or whatever may be the peculiar uh, the peculiarities of your state and your local codes because this program is voluntary you have so much more flexibility for requiring it when applicants opt in and because the savings in time and money is demonstrable uh, we have had quite a bit of interest um, from the development community. We also program the lots. These are simple lot diagrams. By virtue of this pattern zone for Bryan, Texas, we pre-approved ADUs, uh, which were only could only be approved by a complicated process uh, in the past. We pre-approved cottage courts, as well as uh, corner commercial buildings and uh, several things in between. We repaired, uh, we're making an attempt to repair their street networks. You see here on the left hand side, uh, although you can't read the text, that we're requiring cross access easements when parking is located in the rear. And because these uh, criteria are opt in, we are able to require parking in the rear without having to go through what is typically a very involved process uh, of convincing the public that it should be required everywhere. It's not to say that we didn't have an extensive public process to do that, uh, to, do, to implement this, we did. Uh, it's much the same as what you might see for a, uh, a small area plan or a, or a comprehensive plan. Uh, but the outcome is uh, more oriented towards uh, uh, actually uh, getting new building permits. We are laser focused on achieving a, a new building permit volume. One of the best things that I think that may, uh, uh, for, uh, th that makes this worthwhile for a city to implement as we face growing crises like COVID, like the housing crisis that we have acknowledged but not solved, is that we have to do so much more with staff resources. One of the great things for cities about this is that once you've pre-approved a plan, it doesn't have to be reviewed a second time. The site development design has to be reviewed and inspections must occur to ensure that the specifications are being followed. But beyond that, it's a voluntary program. I'll close with this. So many of what we, so much of what we do, um, we only change what is allowed. And we acknowledge, even as we're only changing what is allowed, um, that we don't have much control over what is marketable. And we try to achieve alignment with that. Many times though, intentionally or otherwise, we fail to address what is convenient or what is inconvenient. And it is not enough to change what is allowed. That won't inspire projects. We have to make the kinds of cities that we want to see, the kinds of resiliency that we know that we need in our neighborhoods, as convenient as we possibly can. It has to be more convenient than the suburban vernacular patterns that 
we have uh, uh, come to be so familiar with in America. Uh, happy to talk with anybody about this, um, and I'm especially excited to uh, see what other communities uh, are, are doing in response to the crisis. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Matthew, and thank you to all of our panelists for some, um, some really just sort of, you know, unique perspectives and some positivity, which can uh, go a long way. Uh, I agree with the, those of you that, that mentioned that. Um, uh, I'm going to ask for everybody to stay on just a little bit longer because we have some good questions in the Q&A. I have a couple um, that, that I um, had as well based on the presentations. And the first one that I wanted to, uh, to offer is, Marina, you mentioned collaboration and how, you know, pivoting in the midst of a crisis can the collaboration can be, you know, a useful tool and can be, a, you know, a space for opportunity. And I'm, I'm wondering for all of the folks as you see fit to answer this, you know, it strikes me that the, the overlapping crises that this pandemic has caused um, may create more breadth for that, that sort of collaboration um, in a different way than if it was solely a health crisis or solely an economic crisis or solely a, a, a social crisis. And so um, I wonder if any of you have thoughts about, you know, collaboration with public health folks, you know, something that I think CNU has sought to do, um, you know, for quite a while, uh, folks that work in equity advocacy, um, folks that work in community development, you know, what are the what are the opportunities that any of y'all see in that sort of thing? Well, I'll give a brief answer uh, by way of case study. Uh, here in Fayetteville, we have a four mile stretch of arterial corridor. It's our four mile stretch. It's 30 miles through all the cities in the region. And um, we have struggled to achieve a jurisdictional transfer away from the state for almost a decade. Uh, we couldn't get local uh, cooperation um, to do it. We couldn't get consensus until we did uh, what is called a health audit of the corridor. And uh, that was part of uh, the Healthy Corridors uh, uh, program uh, at the Urban Land Institute. And we worked with uh, three other cities to learn from them, did the health audit and brought in the local medical school uh, to organize all our panels and be the convening force. And it was that uh, that was the turning point to be able to achieve the jurisdictional uh, transfer, which is underway now. Without it, we would not have uh, made that progress in that conversation. I would just say similarly to that in Sandusky, less in the physical corridor planning, but we've had a long standing conversation around public transportation here. And uh, it's always been a city managed effort, even though there is a county benefit to it, primarily employers in the county and residents from the city. I think that the essential, even as our transit numbers have dropped due to COVID-19, the number of people that are still relying on it during what is a, a difficult time to be in transit, uh, to get to their workforce, uh, and, and everyone's talking about workforce right now, et cetera. I think we've been able to meaningfully get public transportation brought into that regional conversation, even for more suburban and rural interests that might not see themselves riding it because they see how critical of a service it is. And we're very hopeful to eventually achieve more of a regional funding mechanism for that because we basically subsidize the rest of the county now uh, on behalf of our own residents who we know need it, but, but it really should be more equitably and regionally funded than it is. And I feel like that is ice. Uh, that ICE has thought a little bit it, uh, for transit in response to COVID-19. Uh, I will add one small thing to that, and that is the fact that um, I, I kind of want to throw that question back at you, Mallory, because this I think the CNU has been particularly effective in reaching out to um, different organization groups in ways that maybe we weren't reaching out 10, 15 years ago. And I think we all, those of us who practice uh, the, the, the design of more resilient communities have benefited from that tremendously. We, we, um, because we're such good collaborators as well, we can reach out to these, to the, um, to the appropriate parties, whether it's strong towns or urban three who have uh, just one obvious example, but who have, um, who can really help cities understand the financial uh, implications of the, of the development decisions they make, whether it's now transportation firms that are on the, on the, on the forefront of showing how you can, uh, how it, it's so logical from a health standpoint to make streets sort of safer for people and and, and provide them with additional um, additional uh, 
statistics that, that carry weight. And then again, to point to cities that have actually done it successfully or towns that have done it successfully, um, I think has, has, an, has, has made it all that much easier. It's not to say that can't, there isn't progress that can be made. You know, I think we all, as Megan spoke, her statistics were quite startling in terms of miss, you know, if, the, if people are missing their absolute basic necessities, they can't focus on the luxuries of planning. So being acutely aware of that and trying, and, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful about these virtual online engagement efforts because what we have seen is that it does increase participation, whether it's through uh, the diff all the different tools that we have seen. I think it's affording us an opportunity to reach those whom we haven't been able to, to, um, to bring into the fold in the past. Uh, Megan, I know that you, UDA works a lot with local community partners. You were talking about that. And um, to what extent do you see um, the adaptation of new urbanist practice to, to really need to have that grounding and localism, to really refocus on that grounding and localism that I know y'all do so well? And, and, and what are some of the, you know, some of the ways to that, as Marina talked about, expanding skills. You know the ways that uh, members of CNU could work on trying to expand that understanding and those relationships. Yeah, that's a it's a great question, and it actually goes back to the first question as well about collaboration and thinking about how do we append um, human capital and capacity building nonprofits to our list of collaborators because that's what who we see um, actually making progress, uh, trackable um, progress in these types of communities. So a lot of times you'll have many nonprofit and community partners on the ground, but there's some overlap or there is a lack of communication and folks understanding who else is doing what. Um, and so it's that overarching umbrella organization that can come in, uh, whether that's urban strategies or um, a purpose-built communities model to understand how to streamline that and fully leverage the community partners that are on the ground and then and then that framework becomes the model and the, the, the delivery model for not only planning but services and upward mobility for families. Um, the that sort of that's a great answer Megan and that that sort of leads me to uh, a trend I was hearing uh, all of you speak I think each one of you mentioned the term livability and you know that this this um, crisis has forced us to look more closely at the livability of our cities of our neighborhoods within those cities of the the breadth of experience of livability not just um, you know that we're providing that that we are providing that across economic spectrums, not just those that can afford, you know, fancy livability, right? And, um, and, and I wanted to ask all of you, you know, in each of your individual experiences and your, your responsibilities and your practices, what would help your work in implementing that sort of livability, not just, you know, in the current crisis, which is an important, you know, stage of this, but going forward, what are, what are some things that could actually help you deliver that a little bit better? Sure, I can, I can start. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in the six years being back home in Sandusky, which is a much smaller city than Cleveland, uh, and, and some of Megan's comments about the, the, intermediaries or the umbrella type organizations that exist in some larger cities, you don't really necessarily have the same level of civic capacity in our smaller towns, nor do you necessarily have those who are educating residents either in an on the ground way, or even just a, a large regional newspaper that tends to cover topics, including urbanism and equity and those things. And so the, I'd say both the political will, as well as the civic capacity of smaller cities tends to be less. You know, when I, when I worked in Cleveland, there was a bike advocacy group. There were, there were neighborhood equity folks that were constantly pressuring us to do better or to think differently. And you don't really see that in a smaller city in the same way. Not that every small city is the same, but, but in, in, it was going from a larger city, even one to 60 miles away to a smaller city. Uh, I've noticed that, that that civic will or capacity or even understanding of why we're having these conversations when there are roads to pave, or there are these basic things that they view as critical to, to come up. And so I think the more that the CNUs of the world can do, or the state, you know, the governments, federal governments, et cetera, philanthropies that focus, uh, you know, beyond just one jurisdiction 
is if they could help to build civic capacity and education in smaller towns, it would go a long way. And, and when you look at small towns or cities collectively, there are a lot of people facing very similar equity challenges and very similar poverty challenges to those in bigger cities. But we often have much fewer minds and, and uh, people dedicated on a day-to-day -day basis to helping us solve our challenges or embrace the opportunities that, that exist for us. I can piggyback on that and just use one example because I think it's a, we could speak about this for hours, but um, one concrete example is how do you get civic? You, you need the civic uh, leadership and the bold vision from those elected leaders and the, and the, and the, and the mayors of the towns to help, uh, to help bring us to, this, to these more resilient, livable, but also equitable cities. And I think one that hits homes for me is um, having, okay, having grown up in Paris is the mayor uh, Anne Hidalgo's in, from Paris, she has a, a, um, a goal to create 15 minute neighborhoods um, with, f at, with, that are accessible, that, that, that are accessible to all the residents. And what she means by that is people having safe transit or safe streets to walk on, um, sort of dignified housing, access to your daily needs, access to um, open space, being able to walk to your schools, and all these things, which I think can really, it's what we all fight for, it's what can help us get to what we need. And so there are these great models out there that, that can show cities how it's being done in other, in, in, yes, in cities like Paris, but I, I can tell you that we're inspired by that and we're looking at that to see how we can um, take those ideas and implement them. But it starts at the top and it starts with leaders that are unapologetic about wanting to change or improve their environments in ways that, um, uh, that, can, that, can, be, that can be the most effective in, in achieving what we all know needs to be achieved. And I think it's going to become that much more apparent now, uh, post pandemic, when we start to see our, um, our worlds change. You know, we're gonna see, we're, 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 if we're to believe the literature out there, we're going to see people, um, office buildings being, people moving out of office buildings and yes, working more from home. So what's gonna happen to these office buildings? Lawrence Kamar wrote, a, wrote an article very recently that talked about, well, maybe there's an opportunity to create affordable housing um, by converting some of these offices into into uh, multifamily homes, you know there's going to be ways in which to convert, to use a historic adaptation and reuse of buildings more effectively, if we have to create emergency facilities in places. But if we don't have the 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 infrastructure, the social infrastructure, uh, to 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 reinforce the physical infrastructure of what a, what it means to live in a neighborhood, it's not going to be that effective. So they go hand in hand. And then I would just, thanks Marina, I would just add a, a very small scale case study to talk about livability, especially as it relates to affordable and mixed income housing. Um, I think, I don't remember who did the poll or the survey recently, but um, a very large percentage of people who responded said that they will never again rent an apartment uh, that doesn't have some sort of private outdoor space. So yes, you know, parks and communal and public space are important, but thinking about people's private space, specifically a balcony, if we're talking about uh, multifamily housing is very important in mixed income and, and affordable housing. I can tell you that's one of the very first things that gets cut in uh, value engineering. And so we've been talking to affordable housing developers about the, the changing context is going to be that we need to find a funding source for these private outdoor spaces that enhance livability of dense urban places. Um, and that goes back to being real about what these funding challenges actually are and what the sources of uh, money are going to need to be to cover them. I think that's a really interesting point, Megan, that we, the, the pandemic has forced us to see certain things in a new light um, that, that, you know, their importance may be different, their relationships to our daily life or to, you know, what our priorities are may be different. There's a good question in the in the Q and A about urban agriculture. Are we going to think about urban agriculture? Are we going to think about our food sources a little bit differently now? Another one that I've seen a lot of lately is micromobility. Is micromobility something that is, you know, much much more important now than it it might have just seemed like a trend uh, a year ago? And now, you know, maybe we're looking at that differently. And I wonder if any of you have some thoughts on, you know, there's obviously regulatory implications, there are design implications of, of, these, of these sorts of, you know, uh, new perspectives. And I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about those. Well, I, I, um, 
I think that it's important that um, we don't forget that um, most of these landscapes that are convertible for urban agricultural purposes, that's the only productive use that they could be put to. And um, it's, it's just a fact that they're running environmental and, and financial deficits for, for these cities and, unless they're put to different land uses. And agriculture may, is probably a sufficient use for a lot of those neighborhoods, maybe not the most central, but a lot, a lot of them, especially in what used to be the hinterlands. But I, um, the notion that, um, I, I think the challenge in implementing that is the same, uh, is, is the same challenge um, in, it, it, that's highlighted in the answers to the previous question, which is that most, that, that is a phenomenal change. That is a, uh, a, a why, that is a change soup to nuts in the way those neighborhoods function today. And that means there are going to be a lot of um, legitimate fears about how those lives of those people living there are going to be impacted. And talking out loud about those when it requires courage. And just like Eric said, these, these towns are lacking in that kind of leadership. When you, I mean, I've had clients that I'll sit across the table from them in a kickoff interview and they will be adamant that their lack of diversity is a strength and they have the beans counted to prove it, right? So these, these towns don't have that kind of courage until they are shown it or inspired to, to choose it. And as, as planners, as, as designers, as, as practitioners, um, I think that the CNU in particular um, is ready, um, even if not explicit, in taking up these moral arguments. There's no, there's no uh, uh, technical approach to these conversations left that works. It's not about convincing people that these new formats are better. We know that, that's provable. It's about convincing them to have the courage for them to make the changes instead of just waiting for somebody else to do it next. And one thing that I would say as to the ability to think differently I have noticed since COVID-19 that a lot of the potentially antiquated or overdone regulatory environments, whether that's increasing patio space for restaurants and fencing, I sense that community attitudes towards that level of enforcement uh, have changed by this. And I feel like we're trying to take advantage of the crisis in some levels by looking at things that not only are helping us to adjust to COVID-19 in this short-term world that we're living in, but can maybe strip away some of the things that, that were unnecessary. And, and I think that that community mindset will be really interesting to see. And whether that's urban agriculture, or whether that's how you treat outdoor dining, or so many other things that are regulatory. You know, we're doing a lot less enforcement from our police department now, our code enforcement is functioning differently during this time frame, And, and so it's, it's kind of interesting to look at what happens when we stop doing some of these things, or we, or we loosen up some certain things, and what, which of these changes we can make permanent uh, coming out of the pandemic. And that's really helpful, Eric, um, and, and, you know, is, is great to hear and, you know, hopefully cities are, are collectively trying to, you know, have similar approaches. I think, you know, we heard a few weeks ago from some, uh, a number of municipal staff members from different cities across the country that were saying some of the same things. So that's, that's really a bright spot. And I think where I want to, um, to end this webinar and to thank all of the panelists for your you know, really thoughtful comments and your, your, your sharing of how you're working to adapt in this crisis, in these crises, and, and hopefully some inspiration for, for folks who are listening in. I want to thank everyone who tuned into this uh, today. The recording will be available on CNU's website. As with all of the previous webinars, um, we'll get that up uh, within 24 hours. And I wanna finally remind folks about CNU 28, a virtual gathering, and that uh, registration is available on uh, our website as well. And thanks everyone, stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, I'm really grateful for the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.